well over the past uh, 15 years. It's almost been 15 years since I've been uh, a part of this church. And one of the easiest aspects of being a part of the life of this body has been uh, thankfulness for the leadership and submission to the leaders over the years. Uh, Something that I hear still to this day oftentimes from uh, newcomers uh, to Grace Bible Church is how humble the leadership is. And that's true. It's just been something that thankfully has marked uh, this church over the years. It was what I was first struck by uh, and found really compelling to be taught by the leaders who were evidently more knowledgeable than me and evidently more humble than I was. And so I thought, I don't know what's in the water there, but I got to get some. Uh, in a few months, uh, in, in November, my own proximity to the leadership uh, will increase, uh, will, will be more distant as we think about church planting. And in preparing for, for that day, that has been just uh, incredibly daunting and also, God has just used that in some interesting ways to cause me to sharpen my own understanding of the, the issue of leadership. As I think about uh, being more distant from our elders, not having uh, the, the men around me currently who I get to lead with to rely on, um, that has really caused me to turn back to the scriptures, uh, to finally read some of the the books on my shelf that I've been waiting to get to uh, and look at the biblical issue of leadership. Um, So the past several months have just been uh, incredibly clarifying for me. Um, It's forced me to just bolt bolt down my convictions about what leadership is, what leadership must do as I think about day one being entrusted with souls in just a, a new way, uh, in a, a way that causes me to sort of launch out uh, on my own in, in a unique way. I'm thankful for, uh, for that opportunity. Um, as, as you know, and as we've talked about church planting, um, I've been praying for years that we would have a plurality of elders uh, in New Orleans, and yet God has seen fit that that won't be the case day one. Uh, you search scripture and see how churches were planted, and it didn't always include uh, a plurality of elders, even though that would be ideal. Um, there's safety in a plurality of leaders, and uh, that won't be the case, it, it doesn't seem, for New Orleans. Uh, But as this matter of leadership has been pressing on my own heart, that's really increased uh, my burden for our church. Uh, The various areas of ministry that I get to oversee, and uh, that includes my small group, as I think about the various men, especially in our body, uh, in 414, trying to uh, sharpen and mature young men who are at crucial, a crucial time in their lives, uh, this issue of leadership has really just been uh, an increasing burden to me. And it's simply because of what's at stake in leadership. Uh, you think about leadership biblically, and you just look at example after example of good leaders, poor leaders, and you can see that leadership matters greatly to God. There is much at stake in who leads a group of people. Just think about on a sports club, uh, the talents and development of uh, a, a young athlete is really at stake in the kind of coaching they receive. Um, you're, all of the, the gifts, talents that God has imparted to an individual just physically, athletically, uh, That matters when it comes to coaching. What they will be matters each season that they get to be coached. Uh, In the classroom, a student's intellectual abilities and his progress in the realm of the mind matters. Even when it comes to character development, there are opportunities in the classroom 
to make those things progress or be a hindrance. And so teachers matter in that realm. Uh, Even in the home, a wife's growth and discernment can be severely hindered or advanced through the leadership of her husband. Uh, Over the years, I've gotten to see uh, negative examples of that and positive. Uh, Perhaps the negative ones stick out most because they're most painful to watch a single gal uh, growing, discerning, godly, mature, marries a man who atrophies in his spiritual zeal and then leads her in a path that just doesn't enhance her discernment. And so a number of years or kids later, and you see, man, there was a lot of promise that doesn't seem to be, uh, to have been laid hold of. That's painful. And even for children in the home, uh, a dad's presence and impact is really determinative in a lot of ways for what that child will be. God's grace, we know, transcends uh, all of our feelings, thankfully, because no dad in the room thinks, man, my child, as well as they've turned out, is all glory be to me. Uh, Hopefully that's none of your attitude. I'm sure it's not. But you know, even the scriptures talk about the glory of children being their fathers. Uh, Dad has a significant impact on the home. And not least of all, to just think about the, the church, in the realm of the church, the very souls of men depend on the faithfulness of their leaders. This is just the way it is. There's nothing you can do to change that. This is the way that God has designed it When it comes to the church, it matters for the good of your own soul, the faithfulness of your leaders. Just turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 if you doubt that. If that sounds like perhaps too strong of a statement, Paul reinforces that kind of thinking. The well-being of your soul, the soul of your, the members of your family, depend on the faithfulness of the leaders at this church. If you consider this your church home, then what your leaders do in private and in public has lasting impact even to an eternal degree. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Paul tells Pastor Timothy, pay close attention to yourself, that's a private matter. Pay close attention, Timothy, to yourself and to your teaching. That's a public matter. Why? He says, persevere in these things because as you do this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. We spent, and and I, I don't think I'll ever forget the class period in seminary when we spent about two hours uh, with Smed just talking about this passage applied to pastoral ministry. And I had a good week and a half to two weeks where I thought, is this really what I want to do with my life? God, is that even wise that you have made the salvation of my own soul and especially of those who hear me depend on my perseverance in the things that he has just described in chapter 4, most notably paying close attention to myself and my doctrine. You will ensure salvation for yourself and those who hear you, and all you have to do, quote-unquote, all you have to do is persevere in paying close attention to yourself and your teaching. You have to keep a close watch on your life and doctrine. And if you don't, if you fail, then the souls of men and women hang in the balance. That's the impact of of biblical leadership. You know, is, is that what you think about? Is that what you thought about in picking this church to be your church? Are the men godly? Do they fear the Lord? 
in their teaching, do they consider watchfulness over themselves, their own lives and hearts, and their teaching of preeminent importance? Because if not, I can't be here. This is how God wants us to think about leadership. Obviously, every individual has their own responsibility over their own souls. We, we know that. Proverbs 4.23, with all watchfulness, watch your own heart, because from it flow the springs of life. Everybody's culpable personally for their own hearts. No one's going to stand before God one day and say, well, it was those leaders you gave me, God and be able to blame them on their own feelings. And at the same time, as true as that is, every man is culpable, responsible for his own soul. God also holds leaders responsible for the souls that he entrusts to their care. Both are true. If you're a leader in any way, a leader at work, a leader in the church, a leader at home, then the aspect, what God says about leadership ought to make us undertake these responsibilities with incredible trepidation. As I've thought about these, these leadership lessons, and we'll look at 10 this morning, but as I've thought about this and just had a, a burden for the men in our church. I just wish every man were here this morning to hear these words, to see these lessons that we're going to learn. If you're a dad, husband, discipler, hopefully you are that. You have the souls of other people under your care that you've taken responsibility for to say, we're going to see you on to maturity with God's help, I'm going to help you. <laughs> Hopefully you've done that. Hopefully you're, you are doing that. And if you are, then this has application for you. Uh, what we'll cover in a couple different equipping hour lessons is a positive and negative example of leadership from the lives of two of Israel's kings. Uh, first, we'll see Hezekiah. He'll be our good example of leadership, and we'll do that this morning from 2 Chronicles chapter 29. So you can just turn there, 2 Chronicles chapter 29. And next time, the next lesson that we'll see is from the life of Saul. He'll be our negative example of leadership. Because of the subject being leadership, this obviously applies to every man among us. But even for the ladies here, whether you're married, whether you're a mom or not, these things apply. Hezekiah's incredible leadership ought to be imitated by every Christian man, single Christian men at home with roommates, Christian men in the workplace, Christian dads at home, Christian husbands in their marriage, and elders and deacons in the church. But even for ladies, if you're single, then this is instructive for you, so you actually know what to look for in a husband one day. If you're married, then you can pray for your husband more knowledgeably, hopefully after this morning. And if you're a mom, then you can shepherd your children, boys and girls, to embrace God's thoughts on good godly leadership. So this is important for all of us. All of us can benefit from God's words on this topic this morning. With that, let's turn our attention to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. And what we'll see from 2 Chronicles 29 is 10 qualities of godly leadership. Hezekiah exhibited 10 qualities of godly leadership in his first year at, as king. You just have to listen carefully. I don't have an outline for you that's going to be up. So follow along as I read, starting in verse 1. Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. 
And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of Yahweh, according to all that David his father had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of Yahweh and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them into the square on the east. Then he said to them, Listen to me, O Levites, set yourselves apart now as holy and set apart as holy the house of Yahweh, the God of your fathers, and bring out the impurity from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what is evil in the sight of Yahweh our God and have forsaken him and turned their faces away from the dwelling place of Yahweh and have turned their backs. They also, they have also shut the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore, the wrath of Yahweh was against Judah and Jerusalem, and he has made them an object of terror, of horror, and of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. And behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to cut a covenant with Yahweh, the God of Israel, that his burning anger may turn away from us. My sons, do not be at ease now, for Yahweh has chosen you to stand before him, to minister to him, and to be his ministers and offer offerings up in smoke. Then the Levites arose, Mahath, the son of Amasai, and Joel, the son of Azariah, from the sons of the Kohathites, and from the sons of Merari, Kish, the, sons of, the son of Abdi, and Azariah, the son of Jahalel, Jahalalel, and from the Gershonites, Joan, the son of Zima, and Eden, the son of Joah, and from the sons of Elizaphon, Shimri, and Jael, and from the sons of Asaph, Zechariah, and Mataniah, and from the sons of Heman, Jehael, and Shimei, and from the sons of Jedathan, Shemaiah, and Uziel. And they gathered their brothers, set them apart as holy, and went in to cleanse the house of Yahweh, according to the commandment of the king, by the words of Yahweh. So the priests went into the inner part of the house of Yahweh to cleanse it, and every unclean thing which they found in the temple of Yahweh, they brought out to the court of the house of Yahweh. Then the Levites received it to bring out to the Kidron Valley to an outer area. Then they began to set it apart as holy on the first day of the first month, and on the eighth day of the, of the month they entered the porch of Yahweh. Then they set apart the house of Yahweh as holy in eight days and completed it on the 16th day of the first month. Then they went in to King Hezekiah and said, We have cleansed the whole house of Yahweh, the altar of burnt offering, with all of its utensils and the table of showbread with all its utensils. Moreover, all the utensils which King Ahaz has rejected during this reign in his unfaithfulness we have prepared and set apart as holy, and behold, they are before the altar of Yahweh. All of this activity happening in the first year of King Hezekiah's reign, this all began with one man. His fear of God and will to get all of this done, this all began with him. Hezekiah exhibited 10 qualities of godly leadership in his first year as king. And this is this whole passage pretty much that's documented records the activity that happens uh, primarily on day one of the first month. That is likely the, the first month of the year, not the first month of 
Hezekiah's reign. Uh, it's possible that this, this happened day one of his reign. More likely that this happened in the first month of the year, though. And this is early on. So this is really recording what's his uh, first activity as king. And here's what he goes after. These 10 qualities begin, number one, with a fear of God. A godly leader, number one, fears God. Fears God. Look at verse two. And he did what was right in the sight of Yahweh. It was in the sight of God that he did what was right. And just notice verse one, when did he do this? When he was 25 years old. He was 25 years old. A lot of our young men in the young adults ministry are about that age. Could you imagine taking control of a nation? What would be your agenda, Alex? (laughs) Josh, day one of leadership. What would you do in your early reign as king? Well, one thing is for sure, you you wouldn't be successful if you did not set your heart to first do what's right in the sight of Yahweh. Just think about in the sight of Yahweh, where only God could see, where only he could know, he set his sights to do what was right in his sight there. Not if my wife thinks it's okay, if my best friends approve, how much can the lowest common denominator, the person, the person furthest away from my life who knows that I'm king, how much can I get away with and still be above reproach in their eyes? It did not matter. Those were not the questions on his mind. What does God think is right? The one who sees every motive, who knows every heart, who will call every deed into judgment, Ecclesiastes 12 says, what does he say is right? I'm going to do what's right in his sight. The person who fears God doesn't have to busy himself fearing man, worrying about what man thinks of him. Because the one with the purest judgment, the best insight, the most comprehensive knowledge of the life, you're living before him. So Hezekiah is a man who fears God. Husbands, you who fear God, you don't have to fear your wife. If you have a godly wife, she will be pleased if you pursue, above all else, pleasing God. If you live in the privacy of your own heart, pleasing to God, then your godly wife will be pleased. Your children, when they grow up, and Lord willing are godly, and they have sense to look back and see the way you govern the home, they will be thankful. Same thing for you moms. Don't live in a way to appease a a two-year-old who doesn't know what's best for him. Live in such a way that one day when that two-year-old, Lord willing, has godly wisdom, he will look back and do what Proverbs 31 says, praise you. Because you didn't give him his way. You didn't cater to every whim. You had a godly fortitude to say, even if this doesn't please my child right now, I'm going to please God. That is what happens in a life who, of one who fears God. And this is what Hezekiah set his heart on. He did what was right in the sight of Yahweh. And just notice This was also, according to verse 2, according to all that David, his father, had done. So the second quality of godly leadership is that it imitates godliness. The godly leader fears God and imitates godliness. Hezekiah is not stepping into this leadership position and wondering, what's going to be a new way of leading? at this crucial point in the nation. We've had poor leadership. I need to come on the scene and leave my mark, leave my legacy by being innovative and new and novel. 
He didn't at, gather all of the, the cultural gurus of the day and say, hey, you've been other places. You have knowledge about what's going on in other world powers who are on the, the world stage right now. What are they doing? And what can we incorporate into our leadership, into this day and age in Israel What's working elsewhere? He he doesn't care. He fears God, and he actually goes after walking in the ways of ancient faithfulness. It says he, according to all that David his father had done, this is what he did. What was right in the sight of Yahweh, according to all that his father David had done. So he takes this old example and imitates it. Even that is a quality of godly leadership, not being innovative, but following an ancient path of faithfulness like David. This is beyond what we read, but just jump down to verse 20. Then King Hezekiah arose early and gathered the princes of the city and went up to the house of Yahweh. Every word of your Bible is inspired, every detail. The chronicler is not ignorant of former revelation. And when you read that first phrase, King Hezekiah, then King Hezekiah arose early, that should trigger older revelation in your mind. He wasn't the first person to do this, nor to record faithfulness in these words. Go back to Genesis 22. When another man had to do something hard and had to exhibit tremendous faith, he did the same thing Hezekiah did. Or Hezekiah did the same thing he did is a better way to put it. God tells Abraham in Genesis 22 to do the impossible or what he would have least preferred. When he says in verse two, take now your son, your only one whom you love, Isaac, and go forth to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. And what does this faithful patriarch do? Verse three, then so Abraham rose early in the morning and he saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then Abraham arose or so Abraham arose is the same phrase we find in Second Chronicles 29 20. Then Hezekiah arose early and he goes to obey. Hezekiah is imitating godliness. He is following ancient examples of faithfulness. Those who have believed God, men like Abraham and David, he is following in their footsteps, imitating their walk. Do you have those examples in front of you? Some of you have that in examples of godly parents. Some of you have that in other examples. We have that in examples from church history and examples in in scripture. Are you seeking to imitate that godliness that you see in the scriptures, that you see in other faithful men and women throughout church history, that you see in your own life around you? Husbands, are you providing an example of godliness for your wives and children to follow? Can you tell them, with complete confidence and sincerity of heart, follow me as I follow Christ. That's not a, hey, if I ever happen to follow Christ, then do that. No, that's follow me because I'm following Christ. And in every way that I'm leaving you a good example, come behind me in it. You can tell others that if you have your sight set on faithful examples, thinking of Christ himself, 
enduring the cross, despising the shame, and for the joy set before him, going all the way, suffering with perfect godliness. You have your sights set on Christ as an example to follow so that people can follow you. Godly leaders fear God and imitate godliness in these ways. Also, just notice thirdly, that a godly leader prioritizes worship. A godly leader prioritizes worship. This is what's happening in all of the reforms that Hezekiah is going after. The first things that he does have to do with Israel's worship. Verse 3, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of Yahweh and repaired them. He opened the doors of the house of Yahweh. Just flip back, because this is a reference. If you go back to chapter 28, why did he have to open the doors of the house of Yahweh? That implies they're closed, right? Look at verse 22 of 2 Chronicles 28. Now in the time of his distress, this same king Ahaz, this is Hezekiah's father, became yet more unfaithful to Yahweh. Indeed, he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had struck him, and said, because of the gods of the kings of Aram, help them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they became the stumbling of him and all Israel. Ahaz gathered together the utensils of the house of God. Then he cut the utensils of the house of God in pieces, and he closed the doors of the house of Yahweh and made altars for himself in every corner of Jerusalem. There could not be a more clear display that he does not want people to worship this God. He closes his house and prevents his worship to the entire nation, does not prevent anyone to enter in and doesn't allow the priest to be in and doing everything that God told them to do. He makes worship a non-option to everybody in Israel by closing the doors and destroying the utensils that they even needed to use to go about carrying out God's sacrifices and offerings. And then, to add sin to his rebellion, he make sure that the only options they have are worshiping other gods by building high places and uh, putting idols in those high places so that they can offer on those altars. This is wicked. And yet Hezekiah, at the tender age of 25, the first thing he does in his reign is overturns his father's legacy. I know what dad did. We're not doing that. And so he prioritizes worship, makes sure that the doors are open, they're repaired. And then verse 4 of chapter 29, he calls the ones who are supposed to lead this system of worship, the priests and the Levites, and gathers them together and then gives them instructions. This is what we're going to be about. Worship of the one true God. Obviously, if he has set his own heart to do what's right in Yahweh's sight, then also he's going to prioritize worship not only for himself, but for others, for the nation. This is his job as king, as the shepherd of Israel. What application does this have for for you dads in the room? Do you prioritize worship for your family? Maybe your, your children are not yet believers even, but is it clear to those unbelieving children, maybe even an unbelieving wife, that for you, this is your priority for them. There is nothing more important in life for you than that they would be true worshipers of the one true God. Do they get that from the things you talk about, where you place entertainment, how you spend your money, And how you spend your time. I mean, y'all are at equipping hour, so I'm assuming they have that impression, right? We didn't wait till 10, 15. 
or 10, 25 to get here. But we were here, and if it's, you know, anything in your house like it is on mine, it is a mad dash on Sunday mornings to, to get here. Even preparing on Saturday nights, it's still chaos on Sunday mornings. It's just how it is. But we're going to be here. This is our priority. And Lord willing, when we're empty nesters and our kids are grown, hopefully godly, they're left with that impression. Mom and dad prioritize us being here under the teaching and preaching of God's word. And even though they were distracted and had to train children to keep still during that time, we know we were there. And the 30 minutes that they heard of the hour was better than nothing. That would be a good impression to leave on on your children. I hope we leave that impression on our children. If you don't work hard at that now when they're young, if you have young children, then don't be surprised when they don't want to be at student ministries, opt out of 414, right? Hezekiah prioritized worship for himself and for the nation. Number four, the fourth quality of godly leadership is that he cultivates convictions. He cultivates convictions. If he's doing this as the first move in his reign as king, he didn't figure all of that out after he became king. He's only 25 years old. Where did he get the convictions? Where did he become convinced that this ought to have been the priority? To undo everything dad worked to do in his reign, and you day one start undoing that, it's on your heart already to do the exact opposite of that. This is a public display of defiance to everything his dad was about. He didn't figure that out at the age of 25. He must have already been cultivating convictions to think of himself living in the palace when his dad is king and just thinking, I can't wait till I become king to change this (laughs) because this should not be. God has said, this is evil, and I'm going to do differently. I'm convinced, despite the example that my dad is setting, that I ought to be different. That would be a shame if our children had to, had to do that, right? The, the psalmist, uh, 119, says that he's wiser than his teachers. He's wiser than those who are older than him because he has performed God's judgments. He's done God's word. He's obeyed God. And that has made him wiser beyond his years. That's Hezekiah growing up under dad, ready to do something different, ready to obey God, even though his dad doesn't. He must have already been cultivating these convictions. Uh, The time to develop, to have convictions about leadership are not after you've been given leadership. If no woman wants to bring herself under your leadership, maybe it's because you don't have the convictions to lead yet. If people under your leadership flounder, then maybe it's because you need to go back to the foundation and develop these convictions about leadership. Fear God, imitate godliness, prioritize worship, cultivate convictions. Even as a godly leader, elders, deacons. We should be cultivating convictions even as leaders, growing in our convictions about leaderships, leadership and every other thing that's biblical. This isn't an arrival. You don't arrive at this, but you have to constantly be a learner, one who is growing in wisdom, growing in discernment, uh, the, the pastors in this church should really set the tone for being a student. You should see your pastors growing constantly, 
learning, reading, listening to sermons, keeping up as they're able with what's going on around them, having biblical opinions, hopefully about what's happening in the culture, so that the sheep coming behind us go, wow, I can follow that leadership because they've got clarity. They're not oblivious to what's going on. Husbands, you should be doing that in your, in your home. You know, don't, don't let your wife outread you. I don't know, some of your wives are, are avid readers. That might be hard. But at least be reading, right? Be learning, be studying the scriptures, be listening and taking in good content so that you have a full heart and out of you pours what you're learning. That should be the pattern. Fifthly, I want you to notice that Hezekiah embraces authority. He embraces authority. That's the fifth quality of godly leadership is that he just embraced the authority that he had been given by God. I'm not talking about other people's authority. He, He certainly would have done that since he was godly, but he embraced the delegated authority that had been given to him by God. Just notice everything about these first few verses just demonstrates that even as a young man, he is owning the leadership that he's been given. He is owning it. He doesn't, there's no sense here that he looked around, became king and said, hey, is is everybody okay if I lead? Would you mind if I act like a king? You've made me king. Is it okay if I just do some things that kings do? He's not asking for permission to lead. He's not seeking approval from men. He knows that he has been made a king. If he obeyed Deuteronomy 17, then he has written out the law. Deuteronomy 17 records that every king of Israel was supposed to write out their own copy of the Torah and keep it with him, readily available to obey what was in it. And so he knows very well what he is supposed to be doing. He knows what the king's job is, and he just gets after it. And so he actually, in this way of embracing authority, took initiative and he took ownership for what he was supposed to be doing. Godly leaders do that. Husbands, do you embrace the leadership, the authority that's been given to you by God? You don't have absolute authority. God has absolute authority. But do you embrace that sliver of authority that God has given you to lead a wife? Do you take initiative in your home to know what you should be doing, to communicate that to your wife, to communicate that to children if you have them? Here's what we have to be doing this week, wife and kids. Just notice, he's 25, verse 11. At 25 years old, he addresses these priests and Levites who would have all certainly been been older than him. And look at what he says, how he addresses them. Verse 11, my sons. (laughs) Okay, that's that's ownership. He is saying he, he's owning his role as leader. My sons, those who have been entrusted to my care, I'm uh, in, as the king, a father to you, just by virtue of being the king. You're supposed to be following me. Godly leaders aren't afraid to step into their role as leader. <clears throat> Just notice he takes the initiative to do what's right. We've already seen that. He acts immediately. (coughs) And he takes initiative to open the doors and prioritize worship. He also takes initiative to repair the doors, according to verse 3. He takes the initiative to bring the priests and the Levites together and to gather them to give them instruction. That's initiative. He knows what he's supposed to be doing, and he gathers everybody together in a formal way and communicates the vision. Notice that, sixthly, 
the godly leader, a godly leader speaks truth. That's what we see in verse 5. A godly leader speaks truth. Then he said to them, listen to me, O Levites. The, the truth that he speaks to them in verses 5 through 11, and then sends them off into action, begins with a command to listen. Listen to me. Is that arrogant to tell the people that you're leading to command them, hear me, listen to me? <coughs> Excuse me. It's only arrogant if you're giving them your own ideas, if you're giving them your own wisdom. But if you're clear like Hezekiah is on what God has said, and you have set your heart to do what he has said, then that's actually humble. Because just notice, according to verse 15, they did all of the things that they did. They set out to cleanse the house according to the commandment of the king by the words of Yahweh. If the people under your leadership obey God by virtue of obeying you, then, then you can tell them to obey, to listen. If you're just telling them what God has said, requiring them to act in keeping with God's commandments, then requiring their obedience is actually humble. And it's in their best interest. It's loving leadership. And so he commands them to listen. And then he gives commandments. So he's speaking the truth authoritatively as God's king, but he's also speaking the truth humbly as God's slave. He doesn't get to make up his own agenda. He is the slave, servant, king of God. And so he instructs them to do what God has already said. And then he's, he's speaking the truth clearly as God's messenger. He's got God's words. And so his commandments are in keeping with what God has already laid out in his word. And so this is authoritative, humble, clear instruction. You know it's clear because the things that he told them to do, they get right to it and they do exactly what he has laid out for them. So it's clear communication. God clearly communicated in his word. Hezekiah took those clear words through which God had communicated and he clearly articulated them for the people. Men, if you don't communicate clearly, if you don't have clarity to communicate, then you're not going to be an effective leader. You've got to be clear in your own mind, and then you've got to be able to clearly tell people what clarity you have and how you want them to go, where you want them to go. Number seven, the seventh quality of godly leadership is that it promotes godliness. It imitates godliness, and then it promotes godliness. Just notice in verse 5 how he requests this of the Levites. Uh, the promotion of godliness, obviously, as we've already seen in verse 2, he requires it of himself because he's doing what's right before God. And he not only requires this godliness of himself, but he promotes godliness by requesting it of others. Set yourselves apart now as holy and set apart as holy the house of Yahweh, the God of your fathers, and bring out the impurity from the holy place. All of these things he's laying before them, these are matters of godliness. This is what it's right to do. And so to set this as the standard before those whom you lead is right. Moms, to set godly, a godly standard in the home before your children and say, this is what we must do is right. Men, to say to your wife and children, this is what we must be about, this is what we must do, to require that of them, to urge them to it, is good and right. And that obviously, again, should always be as one who is going before, who is walking in that, that same pattern of life, 
to say I'm striving for it, you too must strive for this. That's promoting godliness. Number eight, he also opposes error. He opposes error. We've already seen this in verse three because he opens the doors of the house of Yahweh and repaired them. And then just notice in verses six and seven, he calls specific attention to the disobedience of, of a former generation. Verse six, for our fathers have been unfaithful and done what is evil in the sight of Yahweh our God and have forsaken him and turned their faces away from the dwelling place of Yahweh and have turned their backs. He's opposing that error. He's calling attention to the error of that former generation. And specifically, he's he's opposing the error of a ruler. He says in verse 7, They have also shut the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. His, His father led in this. And by his estimation, the rest of the nation was culpable who went to worship idols. And so everybody's indicted and he is not afraid to oppose their error. A couple other things to note. Number nine, this godly leader casts vision. He casts vision according to verse 10. Verse 10 says, now it is in my heart to cut a covenant with Yahweh, the God of Israel, that his burning anger may turn away from us. Uh, So this is, he he properly diagnoses the sin in verses 6 and 7, and then he even discerns God's providence and says, therefore the wrath of God was against Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of terror, horror, hissing. As you see with your own eyes, behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword. Our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. He's able to look at uh, recent history and discern what God thinks about it, why God has done what he's done. Godly leaders are usually ahead of their time in, in terms of their insight to see things that are coming to diagnose what's happening in their day. I think he exhibits this. And he says, hey, they're in captivity for this. He can look at God's word and see what God said was going to happen as a result of their disobedience. And so he agrees with God. He's got that kind of insight to be able to diagnose recent history. But then to move forward, right, it's not just enough to be able to point out the problems, but he actually provides solutions. So he casts vision for this generation. In verse 10, he does this. It is in my heart to cut a covenant with Yahweh, the God of Israel, that his burning anger may turn away from us. So he says, here's the agenda. And he puts it out in front of the people. He does this with transparency of heart. Just notice in verse 10, it is in my heart to cut a covenant with Yahweh. And so he just, in a transparent way, says, this is what I desire to do. He does this with God in mind. He casts this vision because he says, cut a covenant with Yahweh, the God of Israel. And he does this with the end in view, that his burning anger may turn away from us. And then he does it with clarity of communication. As we've already said, it was clear communication because they went and carried out everything he laid, laid before them. So as a, as a leader, as a dad in your home, are you able to cast vision for your family to say, this is what our family has to be about. This is the way that we need to go. Here's how that needs to play out this week with the family schedule and all the rest. Finally, uh, number 10 This 10th quality is that he inspires industry. He inspires industry. After Hezekiah speaks, people get to work. It's a sign of good leadership. Nobody is protesting. They all buy in. 
and say, what you've said is compelling enough. We want to be about that. Jerry Ragg, helpfully uh, in his book, Courageous Churchman, he boils down leadership to really two things, a life compelling enough to follow and a message compelling enough to hear. Hezekiah is that kind of man. He's living a life compelling to, enough to follow, and he's got a message. His communication is compelling enough to hear. And so people get about what he's put in front of them. Just quickly notice that he does this through association with his followers. He calls them my sons. He is not ashamed to associate with them. He inspires industry through calling for diligence. My sons do not be at ease now. So he's calling them to get to work. He inspires industry through reminders of God's choice. For Yahweh has chosen you to stand before him, to minister to him. I mean, how encouraging must that have been to, as a reminder for them, God has chosen you specifically to be about this business. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a gracious act of God. Thank you for reminding us. He's chosen you, put you in this position. And he reminds them, when he, when he reminds them of God's choice, not just of them, but of the privilege that they have. He has chosen you to stand before him. There's a privilege of proximity and of purpose for the Levites and the priests. He has chosen you to stand before him. That's the proximity. They're close to God before him in a unique way. Nobody else got to be this close and of actual purpose to minister to him. And then he reminds them of God's choice of their actual duty to be his ministers and offer offerings up in smoke. So they have been given a unique privilege, proximity, and duty to God. To think about husbands able to remind their wives, here is what God has given you to do. Only you can do this. Only you can fulfill this role as a wife. Go after this, this week in our home. To encourage her to do it well, to equip her with what she needs to go after godliness in your home, and then to do the same thing for your children. God's given you a unique opportunity in life to obey your parents. Do that well this week. Here's what that's going to mean for you specifically. Here's the ways that I've seen that you're tempted to not do that. Here's the ways that I've seen you capable to do that. And here's what it's going to take to go after that. That's, that would be an excellent pattern to set in your home, men, and a godly way to lead to produce industry in your home so that everybody under your influence thrives. By God's grace... <laughs> All of us will lay hold of these 10 aspects of godly leadership and Grace Bible Church will be the better for it. Just examine on your own, take inventory. Where can I apply these principles? Where must I bolster my own ability to lead? And then together, let's get after it. Amen. God, thank you so much for uh, this example, this first example of of good leadership. I pray for the men in our church that we would be more capable, be more exemplary in getting after these things. Help us to take heart. Even uh, wherever we find ourselves in our ability, in the pattern that we've already been setting, help us to excel still more. And God, by your grace, I pray that you would glorify yourself in producing humble, zealous examples of godly leadership at Grace Bible Church. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.